Good morning. Good morning. We won't have a... Thank you. We won't have a test today, but we will have a review again. How's that? Okay? Today is going to be our first day in actually getting in to talk about learning and memory. And I've been leading you into what I'm going to talk about today. So this is why we have two lectures that are devoted to just general things, because some of the same principles we will apply to learning and memory. So let's, let's do our review, okay? I always think review is good. We have different areas of the brain that control different functions. I think everyone is there now. You get the idea that if you have damage to some particular area of the brain, then it means whatever function that area had is lost. Now I want to be sure that you understand it doesn't mean that the area um, is the only area that's involved in a function or that the function actually resides in that area. It's that that area plays some critical part in a network of connections so that if you remove that area or you have brain damage to that area, that function is lost because that part of the network is altered in a particular way. Okay? The cortex is involved in higher order functioning. And again, we talked a little bit about what does it mean to say higher order. Um, breathing is not a higher order function. Okay? Heart rate is not a higher order function. These are controlled by your brain stem. That doesn't mean you can't exert control or some influence on them. It means that they're lower level things that can be taken care of without your conscious thought at all. Higher order type of things are like being able to speak language or to understand the words that I'm saying. I'm just putting together, English has about 50 individual phonemes like b and k. Individual phonemes that get put together in, in a way that allows the native speaker of the language to understand what I'm saying and listen to how fast I'm talking. And short of brain damage, you will never not understand what a native speaker says to you. Okay? So this is a higher order function. Learning and memory are going to be higher order functions. So they're going to be largely under the control of the cortex, different areas of the cortex. Now that doesn't mean that other areas of the brain don't play some role in learning and memory, but they are really higher order and it's going to be the cortical areas that matter the most. So these are, again, these basic principles. What is the cortex involved in? Voluntary thought, I think. I'm thinking something no one in this room could know what it is. Okay? Voluntary thought, voluntary movement, and also our subjective experience. As we look out, we see people, we see objects, we see people we know, this is a subjective experience, something that's going on inside of me. Sometimes people refer to this as the mind. So you have your brain, and we think that the brain is the biological substrate of the mind, which is the subjective experience for the individual. And it is the cortex which is responsible for this. More review. We have, this is our drawing of a neuron. Remember, there's 100 billion of them in the brain alone, 100 billion of these nerve cells. And what you have is you have axons coming in from other areas that are making synapses with the dendritic trees of a given neuron. So this is the cell body, and the dendrites are just an extension of the cell body that gives it a larger surface area. And you could have up to 10,000 inputs to that single neuron. You could have 10,000 synapses coming from other areas. So this is what I mean when I say that if you think about a single area and a function of that single area, that area is connected to many other areas of the brain. If you take that out of the circuit, doctors learn what signs and symptoms that patient will show based on taking that particular area out of a complex circuit. So we have all of these inputs that come in here to the cell body and the dendrites and they cause little tiny electrical changes and if all of them add up to enough 
they cause the axon to fire. And if the axon fires here at the axon hillock, an electrical impulse jumps between those myelin sheaths till it comes down here to the end, and then that axon makes a synapse with another neuron. Everyone with me with that, okay? So you have inputs coming into this cell, this cell firing, and then coming down here and connecting to the next neuron, and then that neuron firing, and going on and connecting to the next neuron, then that neuron firing, and on and on and on. And again, let me emphasize, in the brain alone, 100 billion nerve cells interconnected with 100 trillion synapses. Okay? So you, you, those numbers are so large, you really have to have a feel for what this means. Now, if we go down here and we look in detail at this area, so here's the axon of this neuron, this is the axonal ending, we blow it up, we see that this is the presynaptic axon terminal, and when that electrical impulse gets down here to the end, okay, which is right here, it causes changes in this ending that cause neurotransmitter, which is present in these little tiny vesicles, to be released into a cleft and interact with proteins that are on the postsynaptic or dendrite of the next cell. Okay? So this synapse is going on up here on all these little branches, and down here is onto the branches of the next neuron. And so we say that synaptic transmission is electrochemical. 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 You have electrical impulse in the axon, causes changes that cause a chemical to be released and interact with a postsynaptic dendrite. And then if all that adds up enough, that second neuron fires. And then it releases chemical. And then the next one fires. And on and on and on. Okay? So we're going to see that learning and memory are going to have to do with what areas of the brain are involved in different kinds of memory. And the second thing is going to be, what happens when you remember something? Well, let's stop and think about this. You don't grow new areas in the brain, do you? You're, you don't grow new areas in your brain when you remember something. The changes take place at the synapse. So we're going to want to look at what the changes are at the synapse that we think underlie learning and memory. And it will... So we've been leading you into this, so let's go ahead and start by just being able to learn how to use this thing. Um, by looking at um, general comments about memory, okay? So again, I, I hate these PowerPoints that have a lot of things written on them. And on the other hand, when you go back and look at this, I want it to be able to make sense to you. So memory, there are different types of memory. Memory isn't one thing. And that's very important to understand and will help you when we talk about a disease like Alzheimer's disease. It will help you understand why people who have this disease have changes in memory over time that are different. Okay? So there's uh, different kinds of memory. We're going to be talking about that. This should not surprise you. Specific cortical areas, new and old, meaning New is with six layers of the cortex. Remember, the cortex is the bark made up of layers of neurons. Six layers or new or old cortex. Old cortex is three layers. So it's new or old. It doesn't matter. And non-cortical areas process different types of memory or different aspects of memory. Learning and memory occur over time, as you realize. As you've been coming to this class, if you had never been exposed to anything related to the brain before, you have learned some fundamental principles, I hope, okay? Learning takes place over time. It needs to be reinforced to be remembered. That's why I always start with a review, okay? It needs to be reinforced. Many different individual events, think about this. You, in order to remember something, in order to learn something, first you have to attend to it. 
You have to bring brain mechanisms to attend to something. Then you have to encode, which is the learning part, and then you have to be able to retrieve. That's the memory part. Okay? And many scientists break this down to even more finer categories, and we can show that different brain processes play a role in different aspects of what we call learning and memory. All memory involves changes which occur as the result of experience that allows the organism to alter future behavior. So what, what did this ever evolve for in the first place? Uh, a locust who wants to eat just uh, goes where there's vegetation and just, uh, you know, raises the whole place. And it doesn't say later, you know, I think I'll go back to that other field because I think there was a leaf left there. Okay? He doesn't do that because he doesn't have the mechanism uh, in his little ganglia or his little proto-brain to be able to do that. So we have the ability to say that. We could say, you know, our group needs food. And I remember a few days ago that I think I saw a small plant that I think probably has a tuber. And I'm going to go back to that place and I'm going to dig that tuber up because my family needs food. And so we have this ability to retrieve information that allows us to change our future behavior. And this is going to be really important and for an understanding of diseases like Alzheimer's disease. <coughs> Absolutely, one of the most important things I want you to walk away from this whole series of lectures with is that memory is not a snapshot of an event, but an electrically encoded representation. It's not a snapshot, it's not a Polaroid that takes place. It's a change in the activity at synapses. This, then, if you really understand that statement, will tell you why memory fails us in ways that are going to tell us something very fundamental about what it is and it isn't. The most important thing is it's going to tell us it's not a snapshot. I'm going to throw something out to you that's a preview of what we're going to talk about next week, and that is this. All of you are probably old enough to you're absolutely certain where you were when John F. Kennedy was shot. Mm -hmm. Would it surprise you to know that studies show that about 60% of people are wrong about where they were? Okay? So they did this. Some people swore they were in a particular building and they could show these individuals that that building was not erected until after 1963. They could not have been in the building, okay? And so we laugh about that, but it says something fundamental that we can actually believe that we have a memory that actually is not true, okay? So we're gonna look next time at the specific ways in which memory fails us that gives us clues as neurobiologists as to what memory is really about, okay? So these are just some things we're gonna talk about today. There are different kinds of memory. I've been saying that over and over now. Well, scientists generally classify them into two big categories. This is the broadest category, and it doesn't include everything. And I realize that, but we have to narrow what we're gonna talk about, otherwise we're gonna be here for the next three years, okay? So here's memory. And we usually divide it into these categories. What we call non-declarative memory, which is called implicit memory, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, and declarative or explicit memory. So what I'm gonna focus on in non-declarative or implicit memory is the memory of skills and habits, okay? Governed by different brain areas. Declarative memory is going to be the major focus of what we're going to talk about because when most people think of memory, they think of remembering facts and they think of remembering episodes. You think of the episodes of your life. That's part of your memory, okay? So we're just going to touch on some of these things and it gives you that flavor for you to be able to appreciate memory is not one thing. It's a whole bunch of things, and in a normal person, it gives this incredible richness to our lives. 
it makes us who we are separate from other people and it's something we should value we should treasure and we certainly should take care of our brains to uh, keep it as intact as possible as we age so let's look a little bit about implicit or what we call non-declarative memory this is the memory for skills habits and behaviors okay so I've got up here that it operates without conscious awareness once it's learned. So for example, I can walk without consciously thinking about how to place my foot, one foot in front of the other. Notice also if I walk naturally that I swing my arms. These are habits, part of this is to maintain a balance, um, but as you move in space, but it, for any of you who have children or grandchildren, little kids about a year old, you know, or however old, whatever, um, they get up and they're, you know, and bump, then they're down. And they grab a hold of things to try to stand up like this, and it's very uncoordinated. And they really have to bring their attention to what they do. And the parent or grandparents is back, come on, honey, come on, you can do it. You walk to mommy, come on. And the kids, ah, ah, you know, and comes off to you, okay? I mean, it's wonderful to see this. It's their brains that's maturing. Once you learn how to walk, you don't have to think about it anymore. What would it be like if you had to think about where to place your foot with each step? Now, now take up tennis at your age and say you've never played before and you realize that you're looking at the racket, you're looking at the other person, you're looking at your feet. Take up dancing. People look at their feet and they watch their feet as they move like they can't move without them watching them, okay? So if you take up something new later, it's you have to bring conscious awareness until you learn it once you learn it you don't have to do that anymore that's what we mean by learning you don't have to decode what I'm saying to you as far as the language one day a student said something to me said uh, Dr. Norton in Spanish does hola mean hello and I said no hola means hola it doesn't mean hello it means hola See what the person's doing? They're translating into their native language. And that's not what language is about. Language is about community. It means what it means in that language. And so as you learn something, you don't have to decode it anymore. That's why the beginning foreign language speaker is sitting there, someone says something to you, and you're sitting there and you're trying to compose a sentence and you're really translating it into your own language and then trying to find the words in the next language and then trying to say them. Once you're a fluent speaker, you never think about that again. The words come out of your mouth. And so, these are skills, habits, behaviors. Requires repetition and practice. Je m'appelle Jeannette. My name is Jeannette. Okay? It takes practice to pronounce things in another language. It takes practice to have a good golf swing. One of the things that used to characterize Tiger Woods uh, golf game was that he had a remarkably consistent swing just remarkably consistent and it took years and years and years of practice until it became his brain controlled it without his consciously being aware less likely to be forgotten once it's learned once you learn how to brush your teeth um, you don't really put a whole lot of thought into it when you do it, you know, you know, you just do it. Once you know how to do things, you don't put that conscious effort. And this should tell you something about why we have this big brain and why we're capable of so many things that other animals are not capable of. We can spend our gray matter worrying about other things. Like, how would you build an automobile? Let's go to the automobile plant and think about that. You don't want to be thinking about whether you need to put that foot and then that foot, and then you need to swing your arms. You need to focus on how do you put an automobile together. We can use the conscious parts of our mind to think about other things and let these unconscious things just take care of themselves. Okay? I'm going to tell you, these things can be lost. Okay? If you haven't figured that out in this course, we want to make sure that you understand that, okay? Allows types of behavior to be on autopilot. So here again, this is a terrible thing to say, but you know, you ever drive down the road 
and then you suddenly look around and you think, oh my goodness, I've already gone through Green Hills. <laughs> you know, and it's like you've been on autopilot. And then you get a little bit scared because you think of all the other fools on autopilot. Okay? And you wonder how you ever get anywhere safely. So let me reassure you, you may be on autopilot. I used to tell the medical students that I would, I would crank up before I go teach them. We teach in these four-hour blocks in the medical school, and those kids are intense, okay? I'd turn up Led Zeppelin. I'd just be, man, I'd be screaming away. So by the time I got there, I was ready to go, okay? And, you know, I could go all the way on autopilot. My car knew how to get to Vanderbilt, knew where to park. I could get in on autopilot the whole way. You're on autopilot, but you know there are parts of your brain that aren't on autopilot. They are like sentinels. They're watching the other drivers. They're watching what's happening. And that's why if sudden, suddenly somebody pulls in front of you, you slam on the brakes before you are consciously aware of what's happening. And that's because while your cortex may be on autopilot, there are other parts of your brain that are looking out for you. Okay, so that's a, that's a very reassuring thing. At least for me, okay? Different areas of the brain play a role in implicit memory. Implicit memory is very complex. So for example, last time, I think I mentioned that your ability to swing your arms like this, which is one of these motor programs, is governed by nuclei, which are just collections of neurons that are deep within the hemisphere. It doesn't matter if you remember that. What I will tell you, though, is I gave as an example people who have damage to that area of the brain, who develop Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease, now when they walk, they have short shuffling steps and they don't move their arms when they walk. It's one of the characteristic features that any physician looking at someone walking will immediately know what area of the brain is involved and what disorder this person is likely to have. So those people have lost that natural motor program that allows them to move in space normally and to swing their arms and these other things that we call motor programs. This cerebellum, this little guy at the back here of the brain, it means little cerebrum. So the hemispheres are also called the cerebrum. So this little tiny fish-shaped guy is called the little cerebrum. And the cerebellum, we should say, thank you, cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in learned, skilled motor movement and the proper timing of motor movement. So when you learn how to play racquetball or you learn how to dance or you play tennis or you play the piano. So when you first learn how to play the piano, you're like this and you have to look down at E flat to hit it. Okay? Once you're an experienced pianist, you don't have to look anymore because your brain knows where E flat is. Okay? And it's the cerebellum that allows this. And the cerebellum allows for learned, skilled motor movement. Uh, people who have lesions in the cerebellum can no longer coordinate their motor movement because the proper timing of the contraction and relaxation of their uh, muscles is not coordinated. And these people suffer terribly. They have a lot of uh, really, really serious uh, motor issues. And so um, cerebellum, I used to, uh, I love uh, watching basketball, and Michael Jordan had the most beautiful cerebellum. <laughs> I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, it's true. The guy could jump up in the air, look at the basket, raise his arms, and just do this, and, and hit that basket. And it was like, that's just beautiful. What they, there's an old book, it's a little out of date now, but it's the title of the book that's telling. One of the Nobel Prize winners in neuroscience um, that I knew many years ago uh, wrote the book and it's called The Cerebellum is a Neuronal Machine. Okay? That the cerebellum governs. And to give you an idea of how important it is, you know those 100 billion neurons in the brain? More than 50% of them are in the cerebellum. Okay? The cerebellum is really important in human life. We're also learning that the ability to um, perhaps switch our attention to various things and controlling various aspects of timing of thought 
is also controlled by the cerebellum. This is very, very recent stuff, and we're all very anxious to hear what comes of that. Okay, this is the type of memory that everybody thinks about when they think about memory. And that is what we call explicit memory or declarative memory. So this is going to be the memory that my name is Jeanette, the memory of the fact that you came to this place a week ago, that you're in the middle of a lecture series, the episodes that make up your life, uh, the facts that make up what we do every day. So this is what we're going to spend some time on now. Explicit or declarative memory um, also involves spatial memory. So for example, once you had been in this room, when it was time to leave, you didn't get up and head towards those doors or head up here probably if you wanted to leave and go to the parking lot. You went out there. Because your brain had a spatial map. It didn't matter where you sat in the room, you knew that the parking lot was that direction. Okay? Notice what happens, one of the main things that happens in Alzheimer's disease. Can't let people out of the house because they no longer know how to get back home. And that's because spatial memory is affected and they know they want to go home, but they can't get that map back in their head. They can't get the map back, okay? So spatial memory plays a role in this as well. Can be consciously recalled, that's what we mean by something being a fact, that you can consciously recall it. Will you be wrong sometimes? Yes, but normally when you're wrong, you have this sense that you're wrong, <laughs> and then you you know, fumble trying to retrieve the correct memory and you normally get it. And so um, this is very important. Easy to acquire and easy to forget. <laughs> okay? So um, you might uh, go somewhere and you might meet a person that you're not likely to ever see again. And for some short period of time you might remember their name. Five years from then, Search your memory banks as much as you like. You probably won't remember their name, okay? And so it's easy to acquire initially because a lot of our brain is dedicated to this. It's also easy to forget. Now let's think about why that would have ever evolved or what would be the benefit of that being easy to learn, easy to forget. Well, there is a lady, as we uh, have our class, who's being studied at the University of Irvine. There's a book written about her, and how do you like this? I've forgotten the name of the book. Um, I did read the book. I'm really bad about that. I'll read a book and it'll be really good and I won't remember the title. It's like I never looked at the title. Okay, so she can't forget anything. She remembers every event that has taken place every day of her life since about the age of eight years old. She does not have a good life because memory intrudes on everything. And she re has, is recounting to doctors who are studying her. She obviously has something wrong. Um, doctors that are studying her, she said that about the age of eight is when this started, that somebody would say something and she would s say, no, that's not what happened. And she would correct the person and she can remember every detail about what happened on a particular day. And this has been accumulating and she leads a very sad life because um, she can't focus her attention in the same way that we do. It's good to forget trivia, okay? It's good to do that. Um, otherwise, we can't learn other things. Okay. Now, I love this. No, we're not going to talk about all of this. This is only, this is a handful of the areas of the brain that play a role in explicit memory. So remember what I said is memory is not one thing. And there's a whole bunch of areas that play a role in it. Okay? And we are going to focus on the hippocampus which is part of the hippocampal formation. And we're going to also focus on the prefrontal cortex. Over here I have another nucleus, again just a collection of neurons that plays some specific role called the amygdala, which means almond, plays a role in emotional memory. And so that's a type of memory too that's often considered explicit. 
You can normally recall um, something that evokes a memory. You might be able to recall something previously that has evoked that memory. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, um, when you were speaking about this woman who couldn't forget, and you said it's good to forget some things so we can learn new things, mm -hmm. is there a finite amount that we can retain? Well, we don't know, but we do know that if you have a lot of trivia, it's hard to learn bigger information. It's hard to study physics if your brain is processing every detail of what you did yesterday. So your brain is focused on that. Is there a limit? Um, there probably is a limit, but none of us get anywhere near it. Okay? Okay. So this is really designed only to say that there's many more areas than what I've shown here. If you were a medical student, we would be talking about the ways that di these different areas all played a role in memory, okay? Because patients who have lesions in specific areas in these complicated circuits will show specific kinds of changes in memory. And so they need to know that. For you, what I want to focus on these, and I'm going to come back to this, because emotional memory is a really positive thing in our lives. We don't just remember facts and episodes. We have feelings about particularly episodes. So when we think back on things that have happened in our life, like thinking back on the day that JFK was killed, it evokes an emotional response. It's part of what makes us human. And so we think about where we were what age we were, what our response was. We're trying to remember, we could think about the response our parents had. We think of a lot of these things, but it evokes a memory in us, okay? And so emotional memory is extraordinarily important in, in human beings. Explicit memory involves processing over time. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. The first thing you have to do is attend to something. Okay, I mean, everyone here has turned on a movie and been, you know, and you get 20 minutes into it and you realize you have no clue what's going on. Okay, first you have to bring your attention to the thing. And bringing your attention is partly an executive control thing, and there's many areas of the brain that are involved in it, but I want you to think about this. What if you couldn't bring your attention to focus on something? What if every sound got your attention? What if every movement got your attention? What if every, uh, every time a hair on your hand moved because there was wind that moved the hair, that you suddenly attended to that? We have to have mechanisms that allow us to bring a focus to something. And that's the first step in learning, is to bring that focus and to down, you know, dampen all of the other activity of our brain, okay? And we know that this is, this is what happens. Then you have what's called a working memory. Working memory to me is just very, very cool. Working memory is what allows you, while I'm talking to you right now, to maintain a thread of what I'm talking about. So working memory stays in your head long enough to follow something. So when you're in conversation with another person, there's a thread that, that you follow, that your brain follows. Um, if you're reading a book, there's a thread of what's happening. Have you ever started a book, put it down, and then tried to pick it up a week and a half later, and you're like, huh? You know, who are, who are the characters here? And you have a problem doing that. That's why you need to be consistent about reading a novel at some point so that you can maintain a sort of thread of what's going on. And then you pick that up. So working memory, if I were to tell you, this is my phone number and it's really important that you call me in 10 minutes. You could remember that phone number for a short period of time, but you wouldn't remember it for a long time. Then minutes to years, we have short term and into long term memory. All of these different type of things are controlled by different brain areas. So quickly, because we're going to come back to, to um, some of this information, 
bringing your attention to something involves many areas of the brain and also even areas of the brain stem. So even older areas of the brain are involved in allowing us to focus our attention. And when you leave here, I want you to think about how important it is in learning anything, like if you're learning foreign language, you're learning how to play an instrument, you're learning how to do something, you have to bring your focus of attention to it. If you're thinking about other things, or you're worried about other things, or you're grieving, or anything else that is really dominating your brain, you can't learn, you can't bring your focus of attention. And so this is just really important as a first stage in, in learning. Working memory, um, I told you um, this is what allows you to carry a thread for something. It's temporary, it's very vulnerable to disruption, you can well imagine, okay? So you're talking with someone and you're following the thread of the conversation and somebody else interrupts you and you've got five minutes here, you go back to that other person, you have to think for a second, what was I talking about with this person when I got interrupted? So you, you've got to, um, you know, you, it's really much more difficult to, um, uh, much easier to disrupt. It's very limited in capacity. It's ability to hold some piece of information for a short period of time. It has to constantly be dumped. This is part of what this woman who remembers everything that's ever happened to her, she can't dump her working memory. And this is one of the things they're trying to study about how her brain is different. It allows us a great advantage in planning behavior. We can carry a thread of something for an immediate change in what we're doing because we can carry that thought forward for some short period of time. And if you can't do that, you'd be in a lot of trouble. I put down here, working memory was not selected for for us to remember phone numbers, okay? It's what we use it for often. And it involves multiple areas, the prefrontal cortex. What else do you know the prefrontal cortex is involved in? Come on, somebody yell out the answer. Executive functions, uh, applying morals to behavior, um, planning behavior, doing things like this. Notice where it's at. It's right here, isn't it? That means if you get hit in the front of the head, okay, get hit in the front of the head multiple times in the front of the head, what do you think is one of the consequences? People start having problems with working memory, okay? And inhibiting their emotional impulses, lots of other things that are what we call executive control. Being able to inhibit an emotional response to something, like somebody says something that makes you angry, you don't just beat them up. You have an ability to control your behavior and to inhibit yourself. And so working memory is governed by the same general area of the brain, which is very interesting. Short-term memory. Now I, I have to tell you why I did this little thing over here, okay? Here's a picture of the brain cut in this plane. So it's cut in this plane like this, it doesn't really matter. But this is a very old area of the brain called the hippocampus. And it's one that we're going to focus on. Hippocampus means little seahorse. And as an anatomist, I could never imagine why they called it that, because it didn't look anything like a seahorse to me until I laid him down. Okay? That, see how this goes like, like that? It's like a little seahorse lying down. And early neuroanatomists gave it that name because it reminded them of a little seahorse. This tiny area, I want you to look at that. It's an old cortical area. I want you to look, there's one over here, so the arrow points to the one over here, and this is the highlighted one. There'd obviously be two since you have two hemispheres. The brain is huge. This tiny area of the brain is one of the most important areas in the human brain and one of the most vulnerable to insult. Okay? And the hippocampus is part of a system that plays a role in short-term memory. The other area is in the diencephalon. Do you remember that we have telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, myelencephalon, the five major areas of the human brain. This is the diencephalon pointed out here and then highlighted here for you. Medial, temporal lobe, which is where the hippocampus is located, and medial diencephalon. 
these two together, and I'll never probably use this terminology again, are called medial temporal lobe and medial diencephalic structures. The MTLS system and the MDS system are involved in short-term memory. We're going to focus mostly on the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is an old cortical area, and this is so cool. Okay, you have two hemispheres. The hippocampus is cortical, but it's old cortical, which means it has how many layers? Six or three? Three. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. See, we can learn. All right. The left hippocampus, if you remember, the left hemisphere is specialized for language. And it turns out the left hippocampus is a major structure that allows you to remember language-related things like facts, like words, okay, and things like that. And the right hippocampus is more involved in spatial memory. So, if a person were to have damage to the right hippocampus, they would have trouble like finding their way home or finding their way to a movie theater that they should know where it's at. Whereas a person who has damage to the left hippocampus has trouble remembering words or has trouble remembering facts or episodes of their lives. Now, what do you think it happened if somebody had damage to both sides? That's what happens in Alzheimer's disease. Okay? It's one of the things that happens. Now, one of the most important things about the hippocampus up here, and this is, you know, to a neuroscientist, this is like it doesn't get cooler than this, okay? We know that what the brain does is it takes episodes in your life. About seven years old, you start remembering something about interacting maybe with a family member or mother or whatever. It takes another episode, happened in childhood, and another episode, another, and it starts weaving or constructing what we call an autobiography. Who you think you are. Who you think you are is a construct of your brain. Now that doesn't mean there isn't any reality to it. It means it's a construct of your brain. What does that mean about brain damage? It means it can be taken away. And the hippocampus, the left hippocampus specifically, is involved in this construction of an autobiography. And the autobiography tends to be relatively consistent with who you want to be. <laughs> okay? And there's probably good things about that because it probably plays a role in keeping us from violating our own moral codes, okay, of who we want to be or we want to be seen as, the kind of person we want to be. And the episodes we remember best in our lives generally are consistent with that, with rare exceptions. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about how memory fails us and how that tells us something. Hippocampus, that little bitty seahorse in your brain, has a really difficult task. X happens. One of the things the hippocampus does is say, is this thing that's happening now, is it similar to or different from what has happened in the past? But yet, no two experiences can ever be the same. Can they? I will never look exactly the same to you because I change my hair, I change what I'm wearing, I look different, you see me under different circumstances, but in general we still recognize people when we see them, okay? They don't have to look exactly the same. The brain is capable, the hippocampus can generalize. Now, remember we're going to talk about how memory fails us. Sometimes it generalizes when it shouldn't, right? And you think something is X when it's really Y. So we'll talk about that next time. Long-term memory. One of the things people always say, well, what's different about long-term memory? I mean, I can still, re you know, my grandmother has Alzheimer's disease and she can't remember what was said two minutes ago, but she can remember what happened 75 years ago, okay? Well, there'll come a point where she won't be able to remember that either. But early in the disease, the reason the long-term memory is intact is because long-term memory gets encoded throughout the cortex. 
So long-term memory gets encoded in many areas and is encoded at a molecular level, which means until the neurons die, there's probably multiple representations of long-term sorts of things. That isn't true of short-term memory, it's your hippocampus that plays a role in that. You damage that area, the memory's gone. The short-term memory's gone. For long-term memory, you have to have much more widespread damage to the brain before you lose it. And ultimately in Alzheimer's, that is in fact what happens. So people who have Alzheimer's disease lose working memory. What area of the brain is involved? Prefrontal cortex. They lose short-term memory, both for facts, episodes, and spatial. What area of the brain is involved? Hippocampus. Over time, they lose long-term memory. And that tells you that there's widespread damage throughout the entire cerebral hemispheres. And so that's the progression of the disease that you see these changes in memory. Question here? Well, we'll talk about that next time. We talk about when memory fails us. We can talk about, yes, yes, the brain can block memory, okay? Okay, <laughs> you have to look at that for a second. <clears throat> I'm a big dog person, okay? So you're gonna see pictures of dogs. This is a dog who's watching a skunk eat out of his bowl. He looks very unhappy, <laughs> okay? So memory involves changes as a result of experience <laughs> that allow the organism to alter future behavior, okay? And we laugh about this, but what would it be like if we had to learn everything from scratch every single time? I, I, I mean, animals who have to do that get eaten okay or they get or or worse okay they get sprayed okay now we want to talk about and this is a little bit more conceptually difficult but I've tried to um, summarize this in a way that I hope will be very um, intelligible to you okay I have really tried to emphasize that memory involves different areas of the brain, and you've all got that because you all answered the questions that I just gave you correctly. But what's really happening in those areas are changes at the synaptic level. The area doesn't change in the sense that it's always been there, okay? The changes are occurring down at the synaptic level, so what kind of changes do occur? So, if you try to keep up on neuroscience, even if you're not a neuroscience person, you're always hearing about synaptic plasticity. How many of you have heard of synaptic plasticity? Or heard those terms anyway? Okay, a lot of you. Do you understand fully what that means? Huh? You wondered what it meant. Okay, synaptic plasticity simply means synapses, and this is what our brain does, guys. It's nothing new. It's not a new thing. It's what the brain does every single day. It alters synapses to allow for learning and memory. This is synaptic plasticity. Now, it also involves other systems, but the most obvious system that plays a role, and synaptic plasticity plays a role in, is learning and memory. You learn things every day. You retrieve information every day. And how you do that is by your synapses. Synaptic plasticity means that synapses are not like, we're formed and that's it, it's never going to be different. It means some synapses get strengthened, some get weakened. As we're meeting here every week, certain synapses are being strengthened. If you saw me at the grocery store, you'd probably recognize me now. I may or may not recognize you if I had never seen you before because I'm up here and you're at a distance and I have very poor vision. So I might not recognize you. That doesn't mean anything. It's simply that those synapses didn't get strengthened. Whereas your synapses for me, for that recognition, are being strengthened each time we meet. If you study, remember back when you were a student, you couldn't, most of us, 
could not just read something quickly once and get it all and go in and take a really difficult test and do it. We had to kind of get the gist of what the information was about. Then we had to go back and we had to focus our attention and we had to learn facts and we had to constantly reinforce those facts. Does that make sense? Well, your synapses were plastic. That's what it means. So there's two major ways synapses are plastic. One is whether a given synapse or group of synapses become more efficacious or more reinforced than others. And the other way is if you made new synapses. Okay? So this is synaptic plasticity in a nutshell. Here's our poor little rat. Okay? And he's got an electrode down in his brain so we can see what's going on. So here's, let's look at what happens normally. Here's our action potential, that electrical impulse that's jumping along the axon, gets to the axon terminal, and then causes the little vesicles to release their chemical. Everybody with me? Okay. Binds to the postsynaptic dendrite of the next cell, and when that happens, it causes a little tiny change in the electrical potential of that membrane. And it doesn't matter whether you really understand all that that means or not, it's just that that's what happens. So we say that synaptic transmission is electrochemical electrical. Got it? Electrochemical electrical. So this is a tiny little change. If you added up all those little tiny changes on all those dendrites, then maybe that next cell will fire an action potential and connect with the next neuron, and then with the next neuron, okay? So this is what happens normally. You have a synapse, fires, little bitty change. Now this, don't worry about what this word means. What this means is that what you're going to do is you're going to go in, and we artificially do this, but in learning situations, the exact same thing happens. You're going to constantly reinforce this synapse or this group of synapses. Okay? So you're going to constantly reinforce this. Okay? Now, you're going to go back in and record from this animal's brain again, and you're going to stimulate this synapse, and lo and behold, what happens is more neurotransmitters being released, so the electrical impulse on this side is greatly enhanced. That means this synapse is now transmitting information more efficiently. Okay? The more you review something, the easier it is to recall that information. You study something, you review it. You study something, you review it. When you ask a question, it's easier to get that information recalled, right? And that's because you've been reinforcing through study those synapses that allow for that information to be retrieved. So now this is bigger than that. That means that this next cell is more likely to fire. So we can show that when, say, a monkey learns to, monkeys love raisins and they love orange juice. Um, how, are we okay on time? We're fine. We're fine on time, so I'm going to tell you a funny story from my own uh, background, which is just hysterical, okay? I think so anyway. Um, early in my career, um, I was interested in recording, recording electrical impulses from monkey brains. So I was told that monkeys love raisins and they love orange juice, okay? So I thought, well, orange juice is good for the little guy and everything. And so I set up this apparatus, you know, I built it myself, set up this apparatus, and there was this... So the monkey was sitting looking at a screen. And I was going to train this monkey that every time he saw a particular thing on the screen and he pressed a button, he got a little squirt of orange juice. They learned really quickly because they liked the orange juice. Does that make sense? This is what learning means, right? He, you know, randomly would hit the button, but if it happened at the same time as the thing on the screen, he learns very quickly that when that appears on the screen, if he presses that button, he gets the orange juice. Well, I'm, you know, he's in a, uh, 
com closed compartment and I'm recording from his brain and I notice all of a sudden and I hear all this noise <laughs> you know the monkey's like making all these like really strange noises and everything and I can't figure out why and the electrical impulse in his brain are just going crazy and I think what on earth is going on and I go in and open up the door to this unit that I had him in and there had been a short or something in the circuit that fed the orange juice and he was getting squirted in the face <laughs> and it was like boom, boom, boom. and he's going ah, 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 you know like that and so okay this is what's called negative reinforcement okay and so I went to raisins okay and I double checked the circuit to make sure it wasn't little ballistic bullets that were flying out and hitting this board anyway these are always fun stories you know the episodes of your life okay and the monkey was just coated in sticky orange juice and, and I probably never wanted orange juice again okay so the bottom line is if you put an electrode down in his brain normally and you wanted to train him that every time he saw something a certain thing on the screen that if he pressed the button he got orange juice the way he should get it just a little bit into his mouth he will learn very quickly and you can show that these are the changes that are taking place in his brain that initially when he's exposed and he hits the button and he does the right thing there's not much change every time he does it and he starts to learn now this is what has happened in his brain the pathways that govern his recognition of what he's supposed to press the button to to get the orange juice become reinforced now what do you think let's see guess what happens if you stick him back in the apparatus ten more times and you don't ever give him orange juice when he presses the button goes back to that so if you want to remember things you have to constantly rehearse them um, and you know through repetition so it's like if you're in college and you learn how to speak French don't go to France 40 years later and think you're going to talk to people, okay? I mean, you'd be lucky if you, you can remember any vocabulary at all and you can't put sentences together and, and they get really touchy about it. Okay, so this is one type of learning. Does everyone understand why we call that synaptic plasticity? The synapse itself has altered its mechanism of communicating and what do neurons do? They communicate information to each other. This communicates information about what you've learned and how to use it the other type of way that memory takes place is by making new synapses and we make new synapses every day so I'm neuroscientists in general are really touchy about all these things you hear about oh you know you know you don't need to be paralyzed you can just you know practice this and synaptic plasticity will help you walk again well that's wonderful if that were true and there are circumstances in which that might be true but in general it isn't because if you lose the neuron you're not going to grow a new neuron and a new pathway to allow things to happen but now let's imagine that you have normal neurons and you learn something okay so here we have here's our action potential again coming down here here's our vesicles that are going to be released and everything in some pathways what happens is reinforcing this or these pathways remember it's never one axon it's millions is that it'll sprout a new little axon growth cone so it'll sprout something that will grow over and form a new synapse so now instead of having one synapse here to influence this cell you now have two synapses influencing this cell so that's another type of synaptic plasticity so when people say you grow new pathways what they're really talking about is not the whole pathway being regrown they're talking about doing specific things that allow for a collateral to come off of the main axon terminal and to form another synapse and in some cases of brain damage this is in fact possible Nancy? If that's so, does that apply throughout the life cycle if the brain is not damaged? Well we don't really know the answer to that but I will say that in the normal brain 
there is no question that synaptic plasticity takes place throughout our lives. Okay? Yes, we can learn a foreign language when we're 80 or 90. We know this because of a study that was done on women who were like past 100 who were learning foreign languages and doing things. Okay? Okay, guys? There's hope for all of us. All right. So we know that synaptic plasticity occur. Whether or not plasticity occurs after brain damage is a very complicated issue. It depends on the kind of damage, it depends on whether the blood supply to the area is still intact, it depends on so many factors. Okay? So it's not easy to make a statement about that. Sometimes people recover some function, sometimes they don't. Before I answer another question, I want to tell you about, I, I don't want to forget this. A great study a friend of mine did back in like, I don't know, the early 80s, okay? And nobody could believe this was true. And it's so simple, and that's why it's elegant. The best experiments are the ones that are simple and elegant. So normally when you study, when you use rats in research, they're housed in little cages that are about this big. And the animal has free access to food, so of course they get enormously obese because they're extremely bored because there's nothing there to do but to eat. Okay? So that's what they do. They eat. And they die when they're about three years old. So in research, a three-year-old rat is an ancient rat. So what Bill Greeno did with his graduate students, in his laboratory, he created this huge, like a playpen. And this playpen had all kinds of toys in it. Okay, little wheels the rats could get on and balls and other kinds of toys. And he put a number of rats in this together. They sort of lived communally and they played with all these toys and the people, the young people in the lab would come by and they'd reach down. Rats are really very sweet animals. I, you know, uh, rats that are raised for research are very docile. That's one of the traits we um, select for, okay? So people would go by and they would scratch their heads and, and I remember a, a rat named Bob who used to come up to the side of the thing and elicit scratches to the head and under his arms and everything, okay? Well, what's interesting about this, guys, is that what Bill Greeno found in this study was that the brains of the animals li that lived in this communal way with lots of stimulation to their brain via toys and, and interaction with human and other rats had significantly more synapses in their brain. Not only that, some of them lived to be six and seven years old. And this hit the neuroscience committee community wham because it indicated that a lot of what's going on in the brain when our brains don't work so well has a lot to do possibly with our sedentary lifestyle. Okay? And that will be the subject of my last talk. Nonetheless, what I want you to see here is that these animals, social interaction, affection, brain stimulation, through activity, these animals were much more active because by definition they could be because they had a place to move, resulted in significantly more synapses in the brain. There was a question. Well, we don't know. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't know. Um, people who have special abilities like that, obviously the connections in the hippocampus and other areas of the brain are different than in normal people. But we, we don't have a way yet to get down at that level to see in what way they're different. Okay? Either the pathways um, that fire are somehow different, or the mechanisms that draw attention and, and then the encoding of the memory could be different, the retrieval could be different, or all of the above. I'm sorry, there's so many questions that I can answer, but it's because it's hard to get at these levels, okay, to figure out. I don't even know how my brain is different from yours in, in ability to remember things. So we don't know how photographic memory works. Yes? Yes. Well, 
and you mean specifically in the Western world. So specifically, how does all this play into intelligence? In the Western world, intelligence is defined a lot by the person's memory and ability to recall facts. So in the Western world, this in fact is a big part of what we mean by intelligence. Well, we're all different, aren't we? Some people have more musical talent than other people. Isn't that true? How that person's brain is wired. And part of that is genetic and part of that is experience. So we're all different. You know, um, if someone were to say to me, should I take up a musical instrument at 65 or something like that? I, I'll never be, um, it's at Perlman or whatever. No, you won't, but you get better than you are now. <laughs> That I can tell you. Whether or not you ever get really good depends on some genetic component and other components and other kinds of things. How willing you are to practice, what your motivation is. And there are people born with talent who never use it. Now, in other parts of the world, intelligence could be defined in other ways. So for example, or different kinds of facts, or spatial memory, or other kinds of things. So it's a Western world kind of thing to think that a person who has a large vocabulary is more intelligent. Um, intelligence is obviously a very complex characteristic. And it probably has many, many different traits that figure into it in the overall thing. We say that this person is more intelligent than that person. And it's the whole show we're sort of talking about, okay? Give you uh, a little glimpse. So I've been reading Jared Diamond's new book called The World Until Yesterday. And he's talking about um, more hunter-gatherer type of societies and what they have to teach us about things. In my undergraduate class I taught, I used to put out to the students, I used to say to the students, do you think that there are, are any primitive human beings living on the face of the planet? And most of the students say, yes, there are, you know, like those people in New Guinea, those are primitive people. And I say, no, their society is technologically primitive. I'm asking you if you think they're primitive. Well, it turns out that the average person in New Guinea can speak five separate languages. <laughs> Many of the people that Jared Diamond did research with can speak 15 separate languages fluently. How many of us can do that? <laughs> so you know it all depends on what you mean by intelligence, right? And also during the Second World War there were basically New Guinea individuals who were tribesmen before that who were taught how to fly airplanes. There's nothing primitive about those people. They live in a technologically less sophisticated society, but they live in a very complex and dangerous society, dangerous world. I highly recommend the book. It's very, very interesting. Yes? What is the medium that the, between the synapses that the Okay, no, I got, I got it, I got it. It took me a second there to understand what your question was. What he's asking, if you were to look at a, the brain, it looks like it's all filled, right? But of course it can't be. And in between here is a cleft or an opening. Well, it turns out that around everything in the brain there is space. That space is called extracellular space, meaning outside of the cell, and it's filled with fluid like cerebral spinal fluid and ions. So calcium, sodium, potassium, ions. Okay, is that what you mean? So there is space around things in the brain. So for example, I'll give you one example because it's very important. Let me go back, let me go back to, uh, let me go back here. Now I know I have this. Go back here, sorry. Isn't it horrible when people do this? Okay, so let's look at our synapse here. So you have your 
action potential come down here, the vesicle fuses, it releases its chemical here. Well, what causes that? Well, it turns out that when this action potential, this electrical energy, comes down here, it causes calcium that is out in this extracellular space to enter that terminal. And it's the entrance of the calcium that causes these vesicles to fuse and release their contents. So one of the reasons why we should monitor our intake of something like um, salt isn't just for kidney function, it's also brain function because sodium is a big one in the extracellular space. And so there's fluid in the brain, fluid everywhere, and that fluid has things in it that neurons need to function normally. Yes? Uh, what happens when someone is in a coma, and how is it that they can come out of a coma and be perfectly normal? Um, well, a coma, okay. So, okay, the, it's a little more complex. Why, why can someone in a coma come out of a coma and be okay? So, coma, medically speaking, occurs when you have bilateral damage to either the hemispheres or the diencephalon or an area at the upper part of the mesencephalon. I can't go into more detail than that. But basically, if you have one side working, then you're not in a coma, okay? Now, coma can be transient. It means that you can come out of it. Your brain is still being perfused with blood and everything. So if these are, there are areas in your brain, right there, located here, that actually maintain consciousness. So if those areas don't function, then you're not conscious. But your brain isn't dying. Okay? So as long as your brain is perfused, if those areas of the brain, maybe they got jolted and maybe they shut down for whatever reason, for, you know, there are a variety of reasons why people go into comas, but if that's true, then you can come out of it. So let me give another example uh, that doesn't rely as much on the anatomy. Anesthesia is a drug-induced coma. You come out of that, right? Come out of that, okay? I was talking to one of my uh, anesthesiology colleagues, though, about some neuroscience studies that suggest that if people are put under anesthesia multiple times, they start having problems with their memory. And so I was talking to him about that, and he said, well, it's a drug-induced coma, and the hippocampus, that little seahorse, is very vulnerable to things like loss of oxygen and lots of other things, very sensitive to that. And so there might be a slight bit of damage to that area of the brain every time you're put under general anesthesia. Some people, some people this influences more than others. But if you think about anesthesia is something where you're in a coma, but you can also come out of it and be perfectly fine. Okay, and be perfectly fine. Yes? Yeah, the question is whether or not people retain information that, that something that happens under anesthesia. So let me tell you what, what happens. This is a difficult There are people who come out of anesthesia and swear that they heard the doctors talking, okay? Um, my anesthesiology friends say that if they did, they weren't under the right level of anesthesia, okay? Um, there are different levels of anesthesia, but I will tell you that when you are under anesthesia, information is still going to your visual cortex, it's still going to your auditory cortex, but it's not being processed because the area of the brain that maintains consciousness is being suppressed by the drugs. So um, let me talk about normal. In order for you to remember something, you have to be conscious. So your brain has to be stimulated. So this area of the brain located here stimulates your hippocampus. If that doesn't occur, the hippocampus doesn't process anything. 
So under anesthesia, proper levels of anesthesia, this area of the brain is suppressed, which means it's not stimulating the hippocampus. So theoretically, you should not be able to remember something. Now, we're going to talk about next week about how memory fails us. And sometimes we swear we have a memory of something that has never occurred. Okay? And so this is, this is one of the things that gives us insight into memory in general. Okay? Thank you very much. I hear you're doing yoga today.